great. It's all there. Hello and welcome to another Tyrrell's Classic Workshop. It's been a while, but we're back. Um, there's been lots of questions about one car that's sort of been in the background of various other videos. Uh, and it's this car here, the humble Rover SD1 Vitesse. And this is a very personal car for me because my dad had one of these. Uh, they were terribly difficult to get hold of when they were new and uh, launched in 1976 and started being available during 1977, 78. And there was a waiting list for them. And my dad had one and it was a great car, but unfortunately everything else was very much against it. It was a bit like um, a talented child being born into a dysfunctional family. British Leyland at the time was in a truly parlous state in the mid to late 70s. You had trade union leaders who were intransigent. They couldn't see anything but their own agenda. Same with management. There was so much infighting and politics going on that uh, the car didn't really stand a chance. And that's a tragedy. And in fact, it, it got so bad that eventually, as we know, Rover and the British motor industry largely has either now ceased to exist or fallen into foreign hands. And that's because they couldn't see beyond the end of their noses more often than not. Tragic. But this car is possibly the best example of a very, very good car being born into that. Uh, Jaguar made some fabulous cars during the 70s. They were world beaters in their own way. The styling is very blatantly based on the Ferrari Daytona, which is hardly a bad thing in a way because the Daytona is such a beautiful car. Uh, but it's got these sort of wedge-shaped lights here around the corner, wraparound, which is almost exactly carbon copy Daytona. And it's also got this groove that runs along the sides, also exactly like the Daytona. And this was based on a blood trough in a dagger would you believe? That's what it's commonly known as. Without getting too technical, when a dagger's inserted, it allows the flow of blood out of it. Gruesome, but that's where it came from. Um, and Pininfarina used it as a styling feature on the Daytona and also the 400 Series 365, and Rover robbed it for the V8. But this car is a really good car. Um, the history of the V8 engine is fascinating in its own way. It's perhaps the most successful marriage of American cubic inches, American power, and European everything else, really. Jensen did it with the Interceptor, Gordon Keeble did it, um, ESO did it in Italy, De Tomaso did it. They all bought in um, American firepower uh, for their cars. But the engine, like the best things in life, it sort of happened by accident, really. William Martin Hurst, who was the managing director of Rover in 1962, took a trip over to Wisconsin to General Motors Mercury Marine Engine Division. And um, he was there to talk about a deal for Land Rover in the UK to uh, marinize, to make suitable for boats, their two litre four cylinder engine, which had been with them for many years. It was a wheezy old engine, but it did the job and it was solid and reliable. And he was walking around the Mercury uh, Marine Division and he saw a lovely little cute, all alloy V8 engines sat on a crate on the floor. And he said to them, uh, what, what's this? And they said, well, it's hit the end of its production run. We're not using it anymore because American cars in the 1950s, the last thing they were concerned about was fuel consumption. And you know, all they wanted was to carry all that metal and chrome round with reasonable speed and reasonable ease and reasonable luxury. Forget the fuel consumption, forget the damage on the environment, None of that really mattered. So this engine, because it was only 215 cubic inches, 3528cc, was too small for General Motors to use. They'd used it in the Buick Special, they'd used it in an old, Oldsmobile, and in 1963, it was surplus to requirements. So what uh, William Martin Hurst did was take some measurements and say, I think that engine will slot straight in our saloon cars, and the rest is history. Um, it did slot in the P5 as it was then, and from 1964, unusually, Rover did a deal with General Motors. They bought the whole project. They bought the whole engine, casting dies, everything, lock, stock, and eight smoking barrels from General Motors. And the engine slotted straight in. The Rover 3500 came out, or the P6 3.5, and then the SD1. 
And the beauty of this engine is it is incredibly tunable. The history of this car is it was launched in 76 and the production ceased in 86, so it had a 10-year production run with a facelift in 1982. It's very unusual in the fact that it had a, a tremendously successful competition career, but at the end of its life, not at the beginning. So um, <clears throat> they weren't used in, Jaguar were doing the touring cars with the, the uh, broad speed XJCs, the big cats as they were called, one of which we got in the background here. And um, because of all the infighting and posturing, the SD1 wasn't allowed to get a look in and they were selling all they wanted to. So they had a waiting list for them. Fast forward to the late 80s, um, the SD1 is beginning to wane sort of interest wise for the public. So they, uh, they started using it in competition. Uh, Tom Walkinshaw, people like that, started converting them for track use and for rallying. And they were phenomenally successful. They won prizes year in, year out during the, the mid to late 80s. And the Vitesse was sort of ba the basis of that. It uh, used a 190 brake horsepower version of the V8 engine with sequential fuel injection. And Lucas system, very cobbled together, very just about really, and no more in a lot of ways, sort of electrically and engineering wise, partly the technology of the time, partly budget requirements. And then to give them a final hurrah and to keep them competitive, they brought out a different inlet system um, for the top of the engine in the middle of the V, and it was called the twin plenum, which is a slight inaccuracy because it's actually twin throttles. But they only made 500 of them, which was the basic requirement for, uh, to homologate them, to make them suitable to be used in a, a racing car. So Rover could say, well, there we are, we're making them, so we want to use them on the track. And very few of them survive now, the twin plenum Vitesses. Some have been converted, but there was a very high attrition rate due to rust, accident damage, just things falling apart because of the lovely build quality. Um, and this is a rare survivor. It's come in, it's not particularly our normal fare, but it's a great car. This engine, I believe, has actually had some reworking done inside it. The, the beauty of the twin plenum setup is that Rover stuck to the original 190 brake horsepower power figure, but in reality, they developed more. Um, but Rover didn't have to, didn't re-disclose that as a lot of car manufacturers did in the 60s because they didn't want to have to re-certify the engine emissions wise and all the rest of it. So they kept it the same. But in truth, the twin plenum cars normally from the factory developed an extra 10, 20, 30 brake horsepower over standard. This engine has been reworked. It's actually really, really responsive, this engine. It's got a sports exhaust on it and it's got a remapped injection system. And probably I suspect from the way it's picking up on the throttle response, possibly a lightened flywheel and a sports camshaft. But this car goes and it sounds great. What we've done to the car is done some work on the injection system. It had an intermittent running fault, which we've sorted out. We've replaced the two flexible intake pipes on the induction system. We've given the car a good tidy up. We've had the wooden dashboard inserts repaired and thanks to Jed and the team at GDK Veneering for that. They've done a super job and uh, we've just given the car a bit of a birthday and uh, it's a lovely trip down memory lane to have this car here and to drive it. It was described in period as a poor man's Aston Martin V8. I sort of get that. Strangely enough, particularly with this engine, the power to weight ratio, because they're quite a light car actually for their size, um, is not too different to an Aston Martin V8. So um, this car assuming everything else is on par, would we'll crack 140 miles an hour. Doesn't sound all that fantastic now, but in the 1980s, that was quite respectable. Um, so uh, we're just gonna take the car out for a run, uh, finish sorting the injection out, and uh, hopefully it's performing really well. Well, here we are on the road. Um, this is a, a manual Vitesse. Uh, they did actually sell them as automatics. Uh, in fact, I used to service one for a customer in the 1980s, and it was a very good car with the automatic gearbox. Um, but the, uh, this gearbox was actually specially built for the Rover SD1 originally. It's called the 77mm gearbox. Um, and that was because the distance between the main shaft and the lay shaft and the first motion shaft was, was 77mm between centres. Um, and that normally, the bigger that dimension, the more meter the gearbox 
generalizing very drastically but um, it was a great box it's got a lovely gear change actually really slick because uh, again the gearbox is uh, the gear lever is almost on top of the gearbox it's not uh, it's not a series of cables going to either the front or back of the car uh, so it gives a really lovely precise gear change um, well it's warm through now the temperature gauge is not working which is uh, good old British Leyland wiring from the 1980s it was working and I know the uh, the temperature's fine uh, so let's just uh, let's just open it up and uh, see what sort of power delivery we have oh yes Very nice. Yeah, not a lot wrong with that. Sounds great. Pulling like a train. It's got loads of torque. Um, there we go. Yeah. Yeah, one of the reasons for this car's major success in competition um, was the blend of different qualities of this car. Um, when I said earlier it was like a talented child that had been sort of born into a dysfunctional family, um, the, the car has got talent because the body shell was structurally uh, remarkably stiff for a car of its era, which meant that when you put stiffer suspension on it and um, put it on a racetrack or, or on a rally stage, um, the car actually was torsionally rigid, which meant it handled really well, considering the size of it. And that engine, that V8 engine, is so tunable. Um, and this is fairly mildly tuned, but it's still, I reckon in the real world, this is probably producing thick end of 230, 240 brake horsepower. And um, it's more than enough to propel this car along with, with real gusto. I'll just try it again. No shortage of performance there. Um, what a great... It's, it's just got bags of character, this car. That's the only way I can put it. It's just got loads of character. Um, it's not sterile. Um, it's not a sort of... Just a, a means of transport from A to B. Even in period, it was built as an entertaining car. It's very spacious, very comfortable. The seats are really comfy to sit in. But it has got that lovely, um, tunable, light. Uh, I mean, the, 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 this V8 engine has got so much going for it. It's um, it was relatively cheap to manufacture for an alloy, an alloy blocked engine. Um, it was small. It was barely longer than the four-cylinder Rover engine that they were desperate to update. Um, it's very tunable. Uh, remarkably economical all things considered and um, it actually lasts quite a long time too it was an absolute win-win-win uh, such a marriage made in heaven putting these engines in these cars and of course the Range Rover was originally um, in 1970 intended to have a four-cylinder engine the, 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 the Rover unit um, and when they discovered this gem in the, the mid 1960s that was it. The Range Rover had it from the word go. Um, one of the world's first, if not the world's first, luxury uh, SUV. Um, and part of that was the was the V8 engine. Um, yeah. So all good. The thing about this car is it's so rippy, the engine response on it. It's like a bike engine. You just touch it. I'm just touching the throttle there. Um, one of the other surprises about this car is uh, it's a five-door family saloon stroke hatchback. Um, this is partly because it was so successful in motorsport 
but you can really fling this car around. It does just handle really well. It turns in very crisply. And it's off. Negligible body roll. Um, you really can just uh, throw it round. Fantastic fun. Well, that concludes another Tyrrell's Classic Workshop video. Hope you've enjoyed it. Um, it is worth mentioning as well that um, thanks to, to all the people who tune into this, we've just uh, passed the 2 million mark in 10 months in terms of views, which is fantastic. So a huge thanks to everybody. And um, we've just tipped over the 60,000 subscribers uh, as well. Don't forget it costs nothing to subscribe, um, costs nothing to share. Um, but it does help the channel and it does um, encourage us to keep making them. So um, we'll be back soon.